This is you. And you're in a bit of a pickle right now. See, you just got a beautiful Christmas tree all set up, but the only issue is that you sort of kind of fell for a gimmick when purchasing the lights that are attached to it. Because they came connected to 12 different switches to stay on theme with the 12 days of Christmas or something like that. Now, typically, a switch can be toggled on or off with a simple push of a button, and its state is indicated by its color, with green being on and red being off. And as you might have guessed, the lights will only turn on when all 12 switches are turned on. But with you being the unlucky chap that you are, you got sent a faulty set of switches. Some of them toggle when pressed sometimes, and some just don't toggle at all. And naturally, this started driving you crazy. However, after a few more minutes of meddling around with the switches, you noticed two specific patterns that stayed consistent. You noticed that the rightmost switch could always be toggled on or off at any point. And secondly, you notice that any other switch may be toggled on or off only if the switch to its immediate right is on, and all the other switches to its right, if there are any, are off. So, for example, with a configuration that looks like this, we can only toggle two switches, the first one being this one here to turn it on, or we can toggle the rightmost switch and turn it on as well. Notice that this switch here can't be toggled, even though the switch to its immediate right is on, because for that to be possible, every other switch to its right must be off, which isn't the case. Now, based on these restrictions, you realize that turning on all the switches might not be an impossible task. So the question is, if it is in fact possible, what is the minimum number of moves needed to solve the puzzle and turn on all the switches? Keep in mind that the switches are initially all turned off, and only one switch can be toggled at a time. Here's your chance to pause the video, if you'd like to give it a shot before we go through it together. And yes, it is too late to go back out there to buy a new set of lights. Alright, given the rules that have been set, it kinda seems as though we'll need to work our way from right to left in order to make any progress. Which may lead you to assume that the leftmost switch will have to be the last one toggled in order to solve the puzzle. But notice that that's not possible, because the only way we'd be able to toggle the leftmost switch is if our switch configuration looked like this, which is nowhere close to being done. In fact, the last switch toggled in order to solve the puzzle can only be the rightmost switch or the second to rightmost switch. But how do we even get to a point that looks like either one of these? Well, let's first consider smaller instances of the puzzle involving less switches. This should help us get a better feel for what the general procedure needs to look like. Now, let m of n be the minimum number of moves needed to solve the puzzle with n number of switches. With one switch, the puzzle can easily be solved with one toggle. With two switches, we can turn on the right switch first, followed by the left one, to solve the puzzle in two moves. With three switches, we can turn on the rightmost switch first, which allows us to now turn on the middle switch. Now, notice that we can't toggle the leftmost switch just yet, because the rightmost switch is on. So, to get around this, we just have to turn off the rightmost switch, and then turn on the leftmost switch. And finally, turning the rightmost switch back on completes the puzzle in five moves. Okay, cool. Let's keep going and consider four switches now, which we can solve as follows. Alright, it took 10 moves this time, still nothing crazy so far. At this point, you might be wondering why we're not just trying to solve the original puzzle manually. I mean, if it only takes 10 moves to solve the puzzle with 4 switches, how bad can it possibly be for 12? And to that, I say just give it a try and find out for yourself. It won't take long before you realize that it'll take hundreds if not thousands of moves before you're done. So let's instead try to devise some sort of algorithm that can help us solve the puzzle for any general instance, which we'll then be able to just plug the number 12 into to get the answer we're looking for. Now, your first instinct might be to find some sort of arithmetic or a special type of sequence that aligns with the numbers we've found so far. We can see that there's an uncommon difference that increases by 2 with each term, and from this we can easily extract the following recursive formula. And that's about it, we've done it! Now, just to make sure that it's actually correct, if we plug 5 into this, then solving the puzzle with 5 switches must require 17 moves to complete- oh, wait. It takes 21 moves. That's not good. Okay, let's take a step back and try to make some sense of what's really going on here then. Here's all the information we've gathered up to this point. There's not much to dissect with the first two instances, so let's go ahead and take a look at the third one. If we ignore the leftmost switch for now, notice that we spend the first two moves turning on the two rightmost switches, just like we did in the previous instance. 
As for the next three moves, we first turn off the rightmost switch, next turn on the leftmost switch, and then turn the rightmost switch back on. We could argue that toggling the rightmost switch reflects the procedure from the first instance. This is because we can toggle the rightmost switch whenever we want, and doing so only takes one move, which just so happens to be the number of moves needed to solve the first instance. This logic may seem like a bit of a stretch, but bear with me for now. Let's examine the fourth instance and see if it starts making more sense. Again, ignoring the leftmost switch, we begin by turning on the first three switches from the right, reflecting the exact same procedure from the previous instance. As for the next five moves, we spend the first two of them turning off the two rightmost switches. Notice that this is the exact same procedure from the second instance, but in reverse. This allows us to now turn on the leftmost switch for our next move. And finally, the last two moves are spent turning the two rightmost switches back on, which again reflects the procedure from the second instance. Okay, I think we're onto something. We have a new recursive formula to work with now. But let's not get too excited, you remember what happened last time. So let's put it to the test and see if it holds for 5 switches. Alright, it works. We found the algorithm we're looking for. Although there is one last thing we need to deal with before we pack it up and call it a day. See, we run into a bit of an issue when we try plugging 12 into this. Because that would require us to know what m of 11 and m of 10 are equal to, which would require us to know what m of 9 and m of 8 are equal to, and so on, you get the point. Now, to be fair, this wouldn't take much time at all, given that we're almost halfway there already. And I'll let you do this on your own if you want to jump straight to the answer. But imagine for a second if the Christmas tree lights came with a hundred, or heck, a million switches instead of just twelve. Then doing it this way would take ages. If only there was a way to rewrite this formula without the need to take any previous terms into account. Well, we're in luck, because there is, but it's not going to be that easy. Now, before you go asking why anyone in the right mind would buy Christmas tree lights that come with that many switches, or how would that even be profitable for any organization selling them, you should already know that these questions are of no concern to us. Because we are mathematicians, and no headache is bad enough to stand between us and our pride. <clears throat> Let's just do it. Okay, so what we have here is what's called a recursive sequence, which is just a sequence whose terms are defined using one or more previous terms. And there are two main parts to every recursive sequence the initial conditions, and the recurrence equation itself, or recurrence relation. In our case, we have a second order recurrence, because the elements m of n and m of n minus 2 are two positions apart in the sequence. One of the more well-known second order recursive sequences is the Fibonacci sequence, where the first two terms are just equal to 1, and then every term that comes after is defined as the sum of the previous two terms. Now, this formula is all nice and dandy, but what if I asked you what the, I don't know, 57th Fibonacci number was? Sure, you've got a formula that will eventually get you to the answer, but doing it this way isn't really efficient. Which brings us to this little guy here, which I'm assuming you've come across at some point before. It's an explicit formula for the Fibonacci sequence that'll give you any Fibonacci number by simply plugging a number in for n. And it does so without having to rely on previous terms or any initial conditions. Now, it's important to note that this formula isn't always 100% accurate. It only gives us an approximation that evidently gets less reliable for larger values of n. But nevertheless, it's still a good enough approximation that will not disappoint. This is what's called a closed form solution to the original recurrence relation, and it's exactly the type of thing we're after for our recursive sequence. So the only question is, how do we obtain a closed form solution given some defined recursive sequence? Well, the first thing to note is that not every recursive sequence will have a closed form solution. And to make sure if ours will have one or not, let's try classifying it first. If we move all the m's over to one side, we can see that what we have here is a second order linear non-homogeneous recurrence relation with constant coefficients. And luckily for us, there is a standard technique for solving these. Let's take a look at this theorem, which was pulled from the book Introduction to the Design and Analysis of Algorithms by Anani Levitin which states that the closed form solution to a recurrence relation can be acquired by adding together the general solution to the corresponding homogeneous equation and a particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation. 
Let's try to find the general solution to the homogeneous equation first, which is just the original equation, but setting it equal to zero. To solve this, we use another theorem from the same book, which asks us to first consider the roots of the characteristic equation for the recurrence relation. And then, depending on what case the roots fall under, a formula for the general solution is provided. Now, the characteristic equation is just a quadratic equation with the same coefficients as the recurrence relation. And we can easily solve for the roots of this characteristic equation by using our trusty quadratic formula. Okay, so our roots are negative 1 and 2, which are real and distinct, and so they must fall under the case number 1. Meaning, the general solution to our homogeneous recurrence equation must take on the following form, where alpha and beta are two arbitrary real constants. Now, we will determine the value of these constants, but let's hold off on that just for now. Okay, next we want to find a particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation. First of all, notice that as n approaches infinity, the difference between the values n, n-1, and n-2 becomes negligible, and so they all converge to be equal to one another. So if we assume that some constant c is a particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation, then c must also satisfy the following equation, which we can easily solve. Alright, cool, we're almost done here. Recall that the general solution to our recurrence equation can be obtained by simply adding together the two solutions we just found. And there we have it! The last thing we need to deal with is figuring out what alpha and beta are equal to. And to do that, we need to put our initial conditions to use. This will give us two equations with two unknowns, which I'm sure you can easily solve to obtain the values we're after. And that's it! We found a closed form solution to our recurrence equation, which we can simplify a bit further to distinguish it for even values of n and odd values of n. Alright, here's the moment of truth. We can now plug 12 into this and see that the minimum number of moves needed to solve the puzzle and save Christmas is 2730. Here's a similar question for you, which should be slightly easier than this one. Let's imagine you got sent a different set of faulty switches. This time, all the switches toggle normally when pressed. However, their indicators are all broken, meaning you can never tell which one is on and which one is off. And on top of that, the initial state of each switch is unknown, meaning the starting configuration is completely randomized. So I propose the same question then. What is the minimum number of moves needed to solve the puzzle in the worst case scenario? Comment below and let me know what you think. And if you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to leave a like. It really helps the channel out a lot. And subscribe to stay tuned for the many more math puzzles coming very soon.